All around the world, we are witnessing the rise of right-wing parties and political figures with extremist views. Many people are saying these parties and politicians are fascist. But do we know what fascism is? I am Rodrigo Gim, anthropologist and social critic, and this is Critique with Nietzsche and Foucault. What do you understand when you hear the term fascism? Please comment below so I can enter into a conversation with you. If you believe thinking is fundamental in your life and you think you can debate thought, then please subscribe to this channel because that is our task here. Throughout the world, we are witnessing the electoral rise of right-wing parties and politicians, sometimes even supported by coups and other suspect uh, schemes, as we have experienced here in Brazil, for example. These political figures come with extremely reactionary, racist, xenophobic, chauvinist, and anti-leftist or anti-communist rhetoric. They even call communist or socialist those parties that are far from being so. Their rhetoric divides the world in two sides. Those who are not with them are their enemies. Their nationalism does not include the possibility for radical differences to coexist within the nation state. Some of these right-wing parties and politicians would resort to violence against their own population if they could, and they promote the idea that the population should arm itself to defend itself from itself. Externally, these politicians also look for enemies around the world, as if they were the leading bastions of justice. All of these and other traits have made many people around the world call these parties or politicians as fascists. But how can we understand uh, what fascism is and what it does? That is what I want to talk to you about today. Historians, social scientists, and critics have tried to give a general definition of fascism. The definitions vary a lot there is no final definition of fascism, and that is because there is only one initial social movement, that of Benito Mussolini in Italy in the 1920s, that, was, that called itself fascist. Afterwards, many people made remarks about how Nazism uh, was similar in many respects to fascism, so they also called Nazism fascist. What is predominantly called fascism today is a type of chauvinistic and xenophobic nationalism, which implies combating others who are not identified within this supposed unity of the nation state. The governments that are called fascists choose enemies to fight, internal and external enemies. Immigrants in the United States and in some countries of Europe are both internal and external enemies of those governments. In Brazil, the current government has in the native peoples, the so-called indigenous peoples, their internal enemies and also in the so-called leftists or communists, as they say. There is a witch hunt going on in Brazil today, and I use the term which here, because these enemies of the government are much more fictional than real enemies. In the United States, uh, Donald Trump uses the slogan, America first. Uh, here in Brazil, Bolsonaro uses Brazil above all. What is interesting is that an idea is created of an original national community, even if, if that idea goes against its own history. Indigenous people are the native peoples of the country before the country existed. Nation states throughout the world were created out of violence against their own native peoples, against those that were enslaved and continue to be second-class citizens. In Brazil, we have the continuing genocide of indigenous people and black people that has never stopped. Today, the state uses religion to support the idea of national unity. A dominant religion uh, is confirmed 
and reaffirms as the only religion. In the United States, a common slogan is God bless America. Now in Brazil, our president uses God above all. In India, we have a Hindu fundamentalist group that has taken power and continues to spread violence against others that are not Hindu. Well, this has been going on in also in so many places. Moreover, the so-called fascist governments are dominated by men and have, have patriarchal policies towards women who are treated as not having many rights other than those of childbearing. Women's rights as well as LGBT rights uh, are regarded as abnormal and unnatural, so they are not considered by governments with fascist tendencies. We can say that there is, a, in the world today, a process of fascistization. This term was coined by Angana Chatterjee, who wrote the book Violent Gods, a book about governments of Hindu nationalism with fascist tendencies in India, and she defines the term this way. Citation, a gestational, normalized, and systematic and structural violence on those defined by dominance as other and less than the dominant. Fascism is more a broad concept that is used than a closed uh, truth. It is easier to talk about fascist traits or tendencies, like the Trump government in the United States or Bolsonaro government in Brazil. These governments have traits or tendencies to fascism. Michel Foucault wrote a preface to the book Anti-Oedipus by Deleuze and Guattari. He takes out of this book an art of living, as he called it, and summarized it into seven points, which I shall cite and comment each one. First point, free political action from all unitary and totalizing paranoia. With this first point, Michel Foucault is pointing to one of the main traits of fascism or fascist, a fascist way of life, which is the will to a unitary and totalizing narrative or even practice of ourselves or, or of, or of nations, of groups, when no difference is to be had, where everyone needs to think the same, live the same, or else be excluded, be persecuted, be annihilated, be killed, be go, go to prison, whatever. So fascism is this uh, paranoia of wanting everyone to live and think the same. Second point, develop action, thought and desires by proliferation, juxtaposition and disjunction, and not by subdivision and pyramidal hierarchization. So here Foucault is pointing to the tendencies of our institutions, our practices uh, of power, but also our ways of thinking to make a hierarchy out of everything, to make uh, a hierarchy even of lives, of the value of the lives of, of peoples. So we tend to think of everything in the world as being pyramidal, as being hierarchy uh, of being. Uh, so this tendency, uh, of course, not alone, uh, the seven points of Foucault, they go together uh, as an art of life. Uh, so he's rejecting this, this, uh, these seven points altogether, but uh, as, as warnings to us, not as, uh, he's not giving us the only way to live, that's, it's the opposite of what he's trying to do. But here, hierarchy, when it's linked to this, this desire for a unitary and total paranoia around being, uh, this does not fit well with possibilities of thought, with possibilities of life. Third point, withdraw allegiance from the old categories of the negative the law, the limit, castration, lack, lacuna, which Western thought has so long held sacred as a form of power and an access to reality. Prefer what is positive and multiple, 
difference over uniformity, flows over unities, mobile arrangements over systems, believe that what is productive is not sedentary but nomadic. So here Foucault points to the nomadic uh, or nomadism, which is one of the central concepts uh, held by Deleuze, and it uh, goes against the dominance of fixity, uh, rigidity towards thought, towards being, towards institutions. So the idea that the law, the norm, can define for us the best way to live is, is, is a falsity, is, is a lie, uh, because there is nothing in life that can prove us, that can point to us, that it is better to live a life under laws, under fixed laws that define for us the, all the ways we can live, we can think, than to not live with laws, any law. So uh, it is a prejudice against life to think that norms and laws must fix for us our ways of being, thinking, and living. The fourth point is, do not think that one has to be sad in order to be militant, even though the thing one is fighting is abominable. It is the connection of desire to reality and not its retreat into the forms of representation that possesses revolutionary force. So Foucault is pointing to something that is very common um, in dominant culture today, which is the wanting of revolution as that which affirms my true self in the world or affirms, affirms the truth of society, of the world, as if uh, things in the world has had only one truth and a fixed truth. So basically what Foucault is saying here is that there is no unitary, there is no fixed foundation for what can be called a revolution. Uh, not even the self is, is uh, fixed enough, is uh, monolithic enough, is uh, a point of departure for some revolution to happen because the self is always in a process of change and the world is in a process of change. It is with uh, action happening that we can think that we can act and not uh, w based on a fixed idea of ourselves or of the world that we will provoke what can be called a revolution in the world. So desire in itself cannot be fixed. Desire is a constant moving force in the world. Fifth point, do not use thought to ground a political practice in truth nor political action to discredit as mere speculation a line of thought. Use political practice as an intensifier of thought and analysis as a multiplier of forms and domains for the intervention of political action. So here Foucault brings back the old uh, riddle of the chicken or the egg, which comes first, thought or action? And none, they always have to come together. If you want effective action, you need to work on thought. And if you want thought to reflect on action, thought needs to be always uh, linked to political practice. So political action or practice and thought as political, they come hand in hand. They come together. There is no way to separate them. Thought does not come first and action does not come first. If you only act spontaneously and think that by acting, 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 you might be just reacting to things. And if you only are waiting for the final truth, thought to give you the final truth in order to act, what you will do probably is never act. So they always come together. There is no primacy of action over thought or thought over action. Sixth point, do not demand of politics that it restore the rights of the individual as philosophy has defined them. The individual is the product of power. What is needed is to de-individualize 
by means of multiplication and displacement, diverse combinations. The group must not be the organic bond uniting hierarchized individuals, but a constant generator of de-individualization. So Foucault, again, is pointing to uh, the ways that individual subjects and groups as well are, are always processes in the making. And one needs to look at how we are formed as subjects in order to be able to act within groups. And groups must always question their own assumptions about the subjects and about itself as a subject, as a unity, as a group, as a nation, as a whatever, uh, any unity. So to de-individualize means to look at everything, individuals as well as other types of groups, the state, as processes that depend and cohabit uh, the moment with other processes that are going, always going on. So you need to look at the dynamics, the links, between processes. Every uni everything that seems to be a unity uh, is, is a fiction in a way, because it's, it's a fiction because it's constructed through history, through processes that have been going on and that will continue. Uh, and there's little room to speculate about uh, the future of these processes of, of individuals or of groups um, there is a high margin of unpredictability, of incommensurability about subjects and about groups that always exist. Last point, seven point, do not become enamored of power. So Foucault is asking us not to love, become in love with power. Because to become in love with power means that we are going to uh, leave out all our possibilities for life, for thought, for desire, for action, in favor of a game that is uh, already set in a way for us to give our energy to this game and to participate in this game uh, so that we can have the re rewards of the game. And the reward uh, uh, of power exists uh, for some people that uh, are already within uh, the domains of dominance. Uh, but even for those people that are, are already participating in the dominant, uh, to have power means they're going to have to sacrifice uh, lots and lots of possibilities of life for themselves and, of course, for others as well. So to become in love with power means we are giving up on the possibilities of life for ourselves, on the possibilities of differences and lives to be able to live their own difference in the world. Michel Foucault wished the refusal of all forms of fascism, from the colossal ones that envelop and crush us like uh, state fascism, to the tiny forms, the bitter tyranny of our daily lives. Now I will turn to Nietzsche and what we can take away from him regarding fascism. First, I need to recount that Nietzsche is wrongly linked to fascism. And uh, you know that his work has been used by the Nazis. We know how his sister, who was friends with Hitler, took passages out of context and discarded those passages that were totally against mass politics, against nationalism, against anti-Semitism. Nietzsche, before becoming ill, even broke ties with the composer Richard Wagner, who was his best friend for some time, because of Wagner's anti-Semitism and hyper-nationalism. Here is a passage from the book Beyond Good and Evil. Citation. The Jews are without doubt the strongest, purest, most tenacious race living in Europe today. The fact that the Jews, if they wanted, or if they were forced, as the anti-Semites seem to want, could already be dominant, or indeed could quite literally have control over present-day Europe, this is established. The fact that they are not working and making plans to this end is likewise established. 
Meanwhile, what they wish and want instead is to be absorbed and assimilated into Europe. This urge and impulse should be carefully noted and accommodated, in which case it might be practical and appropriate to throw the anti-Semitic hooligans out of the country. End of citation. That is, Nietzsche is here affirming an admiration for the Jews and asking that the racist uh, Germans be sent out of the country. There are hundreds of passages like this in Nietzsche's books. Nietzsche had no political philosophy. His focus was on a critique of morality as a form of mentality, of herd mentality. For him, herd morality was one of the preconditions for mass politics, where the mass is not thinking for itself. It's conducted into being a mass. And Nietzsche abhorred mass politics. Nietzsche's Zarathustra calls the state, citation, the coldest of all cold monsters. Whatever it says, it lies. Everything about it is false. And concludes that only where the state ends, there begins the human being who is not superfluous. Also in Zarathustra, Nietzsche writes, citation, the delight in the herd is more ancient than the delight in the eye. And as long as the good conscious is identified with the herd, only the bad conscious says I, end of quote. That is, uh, the self in herd morality is identified as the evil to be fought. Any being who is identified as superior, as endowed with intelligence or some superior ability, is readily regarded as the enemy of the herd. The herd was once only lowness or shallow thinking, applauds shallow thinking and the lowness of desire. It is because of this, but not only for this, that the herd here in Brazil applauds every time our president speaks out against science, against art, against the radicality of thought, against the freedom of people over their own bodies, their own desires. Fascistization tries to control the future, to control people, but as much as it tries, it's always failing. And as much as it's always failing, one must be active in order for it to fail and creative so that we are not just reacting to its, its failures. Uh, we need to construct an affirmative culture, uh, to be affirmative of differences, to be affirmative of intelligence, to be affirmative of the arts, to be affirmative of science, to be affirmative of bodies and what people wish to do with their own bodies. So we need to always be active in the sense of affirming ourselves so we are not always responding to the fascistization of culture when it uh, comes with its violence against uh, some group or another. We need to come first ourselves. We need to affirm ourselves in our differences, in our possibilities of life and difference. So our desire becomes affirmative of its own becoming. We are not going to be always in a desire, in a reactive type of desire where when the fascists say something, we react. So we are only reacting to whatever comes as violence against us. We need to come from another space. Dominant culture will still, maybe for some time, be, have these uh, fascist tendencies, but we cannot be on the reactive side. We need to be active. We need to look for other creative spaces of thought, of affirming our, of ourselves, our bodies, our desires, our worlds, and not wait for the affirmation to come where it won't come from, from these fascist groups, parties, and politicians that dominate some of our countries in the world today. Well, people, now I need you to comment, ask questions on YouTube or Facebook so I can enter into a conversation with you. 
This is an immersion in Nietzsche and Foucault. It's a conversation via videos whereby the questions brought by you, I bring to the debate and also bring new questions like I did today. See you next Thursday.